the B-25 Mitchell, one of the most iconic bombers of World War II. You know that it played a crucial role in winning this great conflict, but do you know what it was like to be on board this aircraft for an actual sortie? Well, now, using stunning recreations and expert commentary, we will step into the cockpit and relive an actual combat mission from World War II. And here, you will see if you can survive on board the legendary B-25. Welcome back, boys. While you take in the sun here in Papua New Guinea, let me catch up the new recruits on what we are doing out here. It is currently October of 1943, and we are the pride of the 5th Air Force, the 345th Bomb Group. We are stationed here in the South Pacific and assigned to give hell to the Japanese troops and supply lines in our area. Specifically, we are outfitted with the B-25 Mitchell, a medium bomber that has proved to be a sturdy and reliable aircraft. Although it originally began the war in a traditional bombing role, it was quickly learned that the terrain of the jungle made medium-level bombing difficult, as the enemy could very easily hide their targets in the cover of the trees. Thus, the B-25 has recently been converted to a ground attack aircraft, utilizing its powerful nose guns for strafing and low-level strikes. In the South Pacific, the B-25 was brought down to ground level primarily because of the, the types of targets that they were dealing with. Um, they were dealing with primarily naval targets, a lot of barges. Um, the Japanese were supplying the islands by destroyer and by barges. And to cut the supply lines, you really had to get down low. Also, it, it was just a more effective way of attacking uh, military and ground targets. Um, because you didn't have large industrial areas and large industrial factories and large bridges. Your targets were smaller, harder to hit. So it, it just in the Pacific against, against uh, an enemy dug into the jungle, it, it, the bombers were much more effective at low level. So these are the primary sorties that we find ourselves taking part in. Unfortunately, although effective, these low-level attacks leave us quite a bit more vulnerable to both anti-aircraft and Japanese fighters. Because of this, casualties occur regularly, but this is war and sacrifices must be made. You simply have to pray that every day you won't become one of them. Fortunately, Snafu has been able to get us back home in one piece thus far. Oh, that's right, let me introduce you to Snafu. This is your personal B-25. You don't have to tell me, I know you love the nose art. Our own personal cartoon of the enemy, where it is our custom to give him the bird before every mission. But enough of that, it is almost time for briefing and we need to get our assignments for the day. As in our last bomber mission, you will be given an assignment and your fate will be determined by the actual outcome of this crew member in this fateful mission. After getting your assignment, make sure to comment what position you will be taking so we can see who would have survived. Keep in mind that this recreation seeks to tell the stories of these airmen and remind our generation of the courage and danger that these heroes faced. So without further ado, let's see who you will be assigned to. In order to get your position, you will first need to pick a random number, 1 through 6. Got it? Great. Let's begin. Number one, tail gunner, Sergeant Robert Henderson. Number two, radio man and left waist gunner, Staff Sergeant Millard Sveck. Number three, engineer and right waist gunner, Staff Sergeant George Hardy Jr. Number four, bombardier and navigator, Second Lieutenant Jerome Migliacci. Number five, co-pilot, Second Lieutenant David Koenig. And number six, the respected and admired pilot, Captain Lyle E. Anaker. All right, now that you have your positions and assignments, it is time to head to the briefing room for today's mission. Hurry up, the commander is waiting. If we take a look at the map showing the target for today, we can see that we will be forming up above our airfield here in New Guinea, where we will be setting a course for the northeast with a large number of B-25s from the 345th Bomb Group. From here, our flight path will take us over the ocean for around 200 miles until we make landfall over New Britain, which is currently under the control of the Japanese. 
Here, we will arrive at the northernmost port of Rabaul, a key strategic location for Japanese operations and supply movement. Our targets at this location are anything of value to the Japanese war effort, especially shipping, grounded aircraft, and supply convoys. And since our B-25s have been converted to the ground attack role, this will obviously be a strafing and low-level mission. And we expect the cloud cover to be thick today, so high-level bombing would be ineffective anyways. Well, that is all we have, boys, so let's head to our aircraft and get suited up. Give them hell. Without further delay, we head to our birds, which are now getting warmed up on the runway. You nestle into your position on Snafu and give our nose art the bird once more for good luck. And then, a short while later, it is our turn to take off. The props start moving and we begin to roll down the runway. Our B-25 takes to the air and we are headed to war once again. After forming up with the rest of the 345th, we are headed to our destination and are over the open waters of the Pacific. It is now that we must begin to scan the sky for Japanese fighters. They frequently patrol this area and, being at this low of an altitude, we have a very high chance of seeing some. For today's sortie, however, all is quiet as we approach Rabaul. The Japanese aircraft are likely limited in visibility due to the thick cloud cover, and after a couple of hours in the air, we see the port of Rabaul come into view. The thick jungle below appears and you know the target will be approaching. You and Snafu drop down to an even lower altitude, wanting to make yourself a difficult target for the ground fire. Off your nose, the port can be seen, along with many Japanese ships that are currently at anchor. Enemy resistance thus far has been fairly scarce, and it appears that this might actually turn out to be an easy day. As your flight approaches the target area, the B-25 spread out, striking various points all around the harbor. Below us in the waters are a small group of Japanese cargo ships, filled with all kinds of vital supplies for their troops on the ground. This will be our chosen target. Captain Anaker pushes the nose down and we head towards the vessel. We unload a burst of fire right at the Japanese ship, before preparing to drop our payloads. Bombardier Migliacci opens the Bombay doors and we get right on top of the ship. And as the ship gets lined up, we release our bombs. It appears that one of the bombs indeed found home and significant damage has been done to the cargo ship. Captain Anaker then turns Snafu around and we begin one more strafing run, drilling an anti-aircraft target before we pull out of the attack. These attacks from all of the B-25s of the 345th continue for a few minutes as anti-aircraft is not too intense. Targets all around Rabaul are dealt heavy damage. After our last strafing run, we pull up and receive the order to form up, putting the smoke of the small port behind us. We turn for New Guinea and begin the journey back home. All has gone well and we are very soon back over the open ocean once again. This would be another successful combat mission that we can add to the tally of Snafu, and we could rest easy after a solid mission like today. But unfortunately, it would not be a quiet ride home for the 345th, because moments later, a call goes out over the radio. Zeros, six o'clock high. After the attack on Rabaul, Japanese Zeros have been sent to intercept the raiding party. Apparently, they were not able to arrive in time to defend the target, but they have now located the American flight and are no doubt looking to seek retaliation. Gunners Henderson, Svek, and Hardy, who have had little action thus far, will now do everything they can to defend us. The large group of Zero fighters dive in and open up. The quick and agile aircraft are difficult targets and pepper many of the bombers with their machine guns. But fortunately, the B-25 is a rugged plane and will not go down easily. The Zeros, on the other hand, with little armor and lacking self-sealing fuel tanks, do not take damage very well. A solid burst from a machine gun and they will often burst into a ball of flames. The tough part is landing that burst, however. Nonetheless, the American airmen fire away, trying to keep the Zeros at bay. And today, it does appear that they have some luck. 
the gunners from Snafu and the other aircraft in the flight would actually claim five Zeros destroyed, dealing a serious toll to the attackers, but they too would land hits of their own. As you and the rest of the crew of Snafu carry on and defend the best you can, you feel the aircraft shake and a loud noise come from one of the wings of the plane. You see smoke begin to pour from one of the engines. A Zero has just landed a solid burst on Snafu, and she is clearly hurting. Almost immediately, her speed drops and she begins to fall behind the rest of the flight of bombers. During this strike on our B-25, it also appears that Staff Sergeant George Hardy has been injured. There is blood coming from his head. He is alive and appears to be fully conscious, but he is definitely hurting. As the damage to Snafu becomes more apparent and we begin to fall behind the rest of the flight, Captain Anaker calls out that he will try to bring us down into the waters below. This is likely a good decision because the B-25 appears to be responding to his controls still and bailing out at this low of an altitude would likely present substantial risks. Fortunately, the Zeros have focused their attention on the other bombers and are leaving us alone as we drop down to the surface of the water. But a forced landing in this aircraft is all dependent upon how much control the pilot has over the aircraft. If the aircraft is in perfectly good, good condition and there's not too many waves, you probably, everyone could probably survive. Um, if you come in nose low or something like that and, and you know, the water is pretty hard, then, then people are gonna get thrown around and that's probably the kinds of injuries that, that would occur. Hopefully Snafu comes down easy as Mike mentioned, but we will brace for impact all the same. Don't forget to grab your life vest as we will be getting wet very soon. In moments, we are right above the water and Captain Anaker brings Snafu down. The bomber jerks violently and all of the crew members are thrown about by the impact. It is a rough landing, but with the significant damage that Snafu received, it is about as good as anyone could hope for. Unfortunately, this is where the beloved boys of Snafu would see their first losses. You can see here in the cockpit of this B-25 um, that it is pretty tight. There is not a lot of extra space. So in something like a forced water landing, um, it could potentially be very dangerous if it were not brought down um, perfectly. There is a lot of things that could potentially um, cause an impact, um, some blunt force trauma that might make it very hazardous and, and really make it where the pilot has to bring that aircraft down in a perfect way in order to get his crew out safely. In the rough water landing combined with the potential wounds from the attack in the air, co-pilot 2nd Lieutenant David Koenig and radio man Staff Sergeant Millard Speck would be killed in the crash and would perish along with Snafu. So unfortunately, if you were assigned to positions two or five, you have been killed in action like these American heroes. The four remaining crew members would survive this crash, but not all were unscathed. Staff Sergeant George Hardy was already wounded by the attacking Zero and is now struggling to stay afloat. Bombardier Migliacci is aiding Hardy and doing everything he can to keep him above the water. In addition, Captain Anaker, the pilot of Snafu, has also sustained a serious head wound. And although he did make it out of Snafu, he began to struggle once he made it into the water. Second Lieutenant Migliacci said that he saw him briefly, but was focusing on aiding Staff Sergeant Hardy. This would be the last time that anyone would ever see Captain Anaker as he would slip below the waves shortly after and did not respond to any further calls from the surviving crew. Thus, if you were assigned to position six, the beloved Captain Anaker, I am sorry to tell you that you have given your life in the service of your country. This leaves second Lieutenant Jerome Migliacci, Sergeant Robert Henderson, and the injured Staff Sergeant George Hardy. As these three men attempt to swim ashore to a nearby island, the struggles for George continue to get worse. His wound is clearly taking a toll on him, and Migliacci and Henderson are unable to keep him above the water any longer. 
To their great dismay, Staff Sergeant George Hardy shortly thereafter drifts into the water and perishes. Thus, position number three has also now made the greatest sacrifice. A short time later, the exhausted bombardier Migliacci and tail gunner Robert Henderson make it to the shore. The island they have landed on is known today as Cape Coy, an outlying area of New Britain. By luck, these two airmen would be able to successfully link up with a group of friendly natives. These islanders took the downed Americans to some nearby coast watchers who were assigned to help downed Allied pilots. Second Lieutenant Jerome Migliacci and Sergeant Robert Henderson would live with these locals for six months on the island before they were eventually rescued by a PT boat, surviving this harrowing ordeal. There is no doubt though that these trials and losses that they experienced would stay with them for the rest of their lives. Hopefully recreations like this one can allow the memory of these great men to last for years to come. One more big thanks to the Commemorative Air Force and Air Base Arizona for allowing us to come out here and get the incredible behind the scenes looks and interviews with these incredible warbirds. If you wanna come out and see their beautiful collection, come support their efforts and visit Air Base Arizona uh, in Mesa today. Thanks again, see you guys next time.